Well, hello, Edinburgh. <laughs> How dare I welcome you to, to the Edinburgh International Book Festival, the foremost mm. literature festival, certainly in the United Kingdom, if not in the world. <laughs> Do we agree? It's my favourite anyways, and that's what, that's what counts, because I'm the chair. <laughs> A little bit of power corrupts, does it not? <laughs> but um, an even bigger welcome to, um, to the main event, to today's star turn, Yanis Varoufakis. Please join me in giving him a fantastic Thanks. welcome. Thank you. Now, you will know that um, Yanis requires very, very little uh, introduction. That's why he's, he's, uh, he's doing about 17 different events at this festival um, and uh, interviewing various up-and-coming people, including, I think, my boss uh, in, a, in a couple of days. So I'm going to sort of try and behave myself. He might put in a word for me. M my like daughter that. puts it in two words. Yeah. Dad, you have verbal diarrhea. Well, that's... Uh, that's to be seen. <laughs> but he is a people's economist. He has confounded my expectations about economists. And he has, in particular, written very recently two wonderful books that I know you'll want to, to buy and read if you haven't already. The most recent books being Adults in the Room, uh, a beautifully written Greek tragedy about <laughs> Yanis's um, experiences of being a minister. Of, of, that, of that journey from, from academic and activist to finance minister and the, and the Greek tragedy that ensued, ensued beautifully written. It, it reads like a, like a novel, like a thriller. Um, I, I really do um, encourage you to read it. And then for people like me who thought that um, economics was a discipline that was, uh, was really deliberately mystified by people who were presenting it as some kind of natural science rather than the politics that I always suspected it was, I do recommend talking to my daughter about the economy. And it's a fantastic conceit because I think your daughter, Yanis, is 14, but I actually felt it was written for 49-year-olds like me. But that's why, what we do. That's what we do. We, pre we pretend to write books for teenagers so that we can read them. <laughs> well, it worked for J.K. Rowling, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so all the best with that, but, but I'm sure this audience will want to know just a little bit about your beginnings and your motivations. I know you talk, uh, not a huge amount, but a little bit in, uh, in both books about your parents. Perhaps you speak a little more about your dad than your mum, but would you just tell, tell me a little bit about those early influences? Well, in a sense, the, my mother and father are... Um, a reflection of a polarized Greek society. Uh, my mother, I remember telling me, you know, when I was young, that she, was, she grew up during a fascist dictatorship. We had a, a fascist regime that was installed in Greece in 1936, so she was becoming an adult during that time. And I was growing up in a fascist dictatorship that was installed in 1967, so um, <laughs> it was, we had this common uh, foundation. But on top of that, uh, look, I'll just cut to the chase very, very quickly as to why my mum and dad represented polarized society. Um, my father ended up in a concentration camp um, for communists. He wasn't a communist. They put him in there because he refused to denounce communism on the basis that the state does not have the right to ask him to denounce Buddhism, Islam, communism, anything. And of course they said, okay, off you go, straight into the concentration camp. And of course that was a camp for communists, so he, be he joined the communist party. <laughs> <laughs> so they turned him into a communist. Um, and then he came out, four years later, um, a shadow of a man, yeah. and went back to the School of Chemistry of Athens University, which is where my mother, as a slightly younger person, had just entered, and she was the first female 
student ever to have entered the natural sciences at the University of Athens, and you can imagine uh, the, the kind of uh, treatment that she received from professors, from fellow students, the discrimination. So she, had to, she became a proto-feminist as a result of this experience. But because she had a very bad experience with communists in her neighborhood during the Civil War, she had become anti-communist. And she was approached by a fascist anti-communist student group and recruited. And they could see that she needed some kind of support mechanism, so they recruited for a couple of months. Her first mission was to keep tabs on a communist who had just come back from a concentration camp. <laughs> um, and to give in reports that would go to the fascist uh, grouping, and the fascist grouping would then pass it on to the police. Uh, and I'm the result. <laughs> but I remember, you know, when I was a much older person, of course, you know, very soon after that, the two of them converged uh, politically to the left wing of the Labour Party, or the equivalent of the Labour Party. Yeah? Um, but during moments of tension in the household, uh, there were occasions when my mother would call him a bloody commie, <laughs> and she would call her a, a bloody fascist. <laughs> but, you know, very, 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 very briefly. In the so, nicest possible way. <laughs> in the nicest possible way. And one of the things we have, in, we have a number of things in common, comrade, but, um, <laughs> but we have the University of Essex um, in, in, in common, and you, you studied first maths and then became the economist that you Actually, are. Actually, it's slightly more complicated. I yeah. think you will enjoy that. Um, I enrolled to study to, 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 on a joint economics and mathematics right. degree, but two weeks into semester one of year one, um, I realized that economics was third-rate mathematics. So I thought, well, why should I study third-rate mathematics? He said I, that. Well I didn't first, say that, okay. First-rate mathematics. I didn't say so I dropped economics altogether. So I don't have a first degree in economics. <gasps> I almost escaped economics cleanly and efficiently. I, I don't and then I did a did. master's in mathematics. So I oh. thought that I had made a clean getaway. So from here's economics. my question, Yanis. These books are so beautifully written. They are, not, <laughs> they are not written by a maths or economics wonk. They are full, they are rich with literary references and cultural references, everything from Star Trek and the Matrix to Mephistopheles and Shakespeare. Where did all that come from? Well, Shami, where does our culture come from? It doesn't come from school. <laughs> it doesn't come from university. If you rely on your school and your university for your culture, you end up like Boris Johnson. <laughs> wow. I, I, I can see that we're, we're so into... So you don't read on your own, we're into because you enjoy We're into letterbox diplomacy this afternoon, I think. <laughs> right. He's floored me with the Boris Johnson um, <laughs> remark. I didn't, think I'd, I didn't think I'd have to deal with Boris Johnson in, um, in Edinburgh, I have to say, uh, of all places. But more seriously, yeah. this book, Adults in the Room, is your story, your very personal story about that experience, that extraordinary experience that you had in, to, in 2015, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of going um, as this you know, already world-class economist already a seasoned activist, but literally going into the jaws of the deep establishment and becoming a finance minister. I mean, was it at all therapeutic to write? I think it was probably painful to write, but... Well, usually therapeutic ex experiences are painful. Therapy has to be painful in order to work, right? Uh, I, I wrote it because I... I, I, I my partner in everything that I here, she can testify to this. When I, when, when I resigned, I just had this great urge to make sure that I put things on paper before I forgot what happened, uh, as a record. Uh, it was extremely painful. Uh, I had to relive the, that six-month period uh, without the hope or the adrenaline. So the first time when you experience something that is extremely tumultuous, something that is very um, stressful, at least you are being carried 
by the adrenaline and the sense of optimism that, and hopefulness that something good may come out of it. And you wrote... When you relive yeah. it without them, it, it's very painful. But in the end, of course, it was cathartic. So Yanis wrote of the moment when he was presented with this opportunity stroke dilemma of taking on this very, very impossible, some would say impossible, but certainly hugely important job of being the finance minister of a bankrupt country that was seeking to renegotiate, seeking to take on the Troika, the great financial institutions of the continent and the globe, really. And he, he wrote, the moment of truth had arrived in front of me there lay an offer I could refuse. The risks of accepting were clear and mountainous. Whilst I liked Alexis, the Greek Prime Minister that is, and was willing to believe in him, the events of 2012 and more recently his casual disregard of our stoneship agreement to involve me in the shaping of Syria's Thessalonica programme had given me more than sufficient cause for scepticism. And as Danai said, that's Yanis' wife, after my subsequent return to Austin, I was exploitable because I was expendable. If you bring back a decent deal, they will claim the credit. If not, you will get the blame. But at the same time, when you are facing the reality of a nation in debt bondage, and two generations that are being unnecessarily and brutishly wasted, because that's what we have in Greece. We have a process of desertification. We are losing 15,000 young people every month because it's a bankrupt country, which is kept bankrupt for political reasons that have nothing to do with Greece. Uh, at, at that point, you think, okay, even if there is one chance in a million that by accepting that position, you can make a difference. Do you really have an op option? Uh, you have to take it. I mean, you have an option, but, but not morally. Uh, you have to, to accept the crushing calculus of probabilities um, just in case one tiny possibility materializes and you help your fellow citizens escape from effectively a debtor's prison, a, a kind of Victorian mm -hmm. workhouse. This is what Greece has become since 2010. And it was worth it, that even though I failed. That debtor's prison metaphor is incredibly, incredibly powerful for the bondage that you described. There are many villains in, in your book, if I may say so. There are lots of flawed people yeah. and frail people, but there are, there are many villains, I would say, people that are hugely disappointing, people that were just double dealing, people who said one thing to you in private and then said something else in an official meeting at the highest levels. But that's politics, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's the, uh, the, 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 the vast majority of politicians are like that. Uh, and, and we know that. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I entered that scene, I knew was, th this was going to happen. Uh, I didn't expect it of the people that lured me into doing it, with whom we had supposedly uh, a bond of brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, but, um, the, look, I, when I was writing this book, I tried not to have any villains in it, except perhaps one, <laughs> whom I'm not going to mention. That's my punishment um, of him. <laughs> uh, I tried to portray everyone, to give every character in that book their best chance to defend what they were doing by presenting their own thinking the, what they, the stories they were telling themselves for doing what they were do, doing. Um, in a sense, I tried to write this, th 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 these, these characters uh, as faithfully to reality as I could, and in a way that did not demonize them. Uh, in a way that pres effectively how playwrights write you know, mm. characters who are flawed, uh, who are neither very bad nor very good, who are doing what they think is best, given their circumstances, their constraints, but whose actions, when combined with one another's, uh, produce a tragedy. Well, it's interesting that you talk about playwrights, because I've said to our friends here that it reads like a novel, but there are times when it is actually written like a 
like a, like a play, because you do go into verbatim, verbatim script almost of, of your words and the other words. How, how, is that, how is that possible? Were you doing a little surveillance of your own? Uh, you, you mean, of, of course I was. Yeah. Of course. What, you were recording, you were secretly recording conversations? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it didn't happen by design. Look, let me, let me, let me share this. It's in the it's book, okay, but just I'll, a few I'll share of us. the next Nobody's going to say I go anything. into it's the first meeting of ministers of finance. Yeah? That was my inaugural Eurogroup meeting, as it's called. The meeting had me at the center being attacked constantly and mercilessly by the German finance minister, by his uh, cheerleaders, who were the, you know, the finance ministers of former communist countries, uh, by the uh, Spanish finance minister and the Portuguese finance minister, who had imposed upon their countries crashing austerity, and therefore, if, they, if I managed to get away without doing the same, then they would have trouble explaining to their own people as to why you know, they didn't do a Varoufakis, as they put it. Um, so, ten and a half hours, I was you know, just receiving the slings and arrows of about 30 people in there. At the end of that meeting, which was a soul-destroying meeting, uh, I came out dazed, confused, um, with a threat that the banks of our nation would be closed within five days. These are seriously stressful moments. I had to give a con press conference exuding confidence and optimism, because this is what a finance minister must do, when inside me I was dying. Uh, and then immediately after the press conference, I called my secretary and said, Fotini, uh, get me a transcript of the tenth and a half hours. Because the next day, I would have to go to my parliament in Athens to report to the House what had happened during those ten and a half hours, because that was a meeting in secret. Yeah? And I would have to inform the cabinet, the prime minister, and I have to, uh, to confess that after ten and a half hours, of course, I remember what had happened, but not verbatim. Mm. You know, you, when you are under so much psychological and physical uh, stress, uh, there are things you, you forgot who exactly said what and the order in which it was said. So I asked for a transcript, a minutes of the meeting. And she called me ten minutes later saying, Minister, I was told that there are no minutes, no records at all. Meanwhile, yeah, this happened two or three or four times. So I would also have tete-a-tete -tete meetings with um, the, the Commission, with the International Monetary Fund, with the European Central Bank. And I kept, uh, I, I respected the rules of confidentiality. They didn't. No. They were leaking to the press horribly distorted versions of what had been said by me, by them. And I realized that there's no way I can defend myself. Because, you know, the, uh, the press corps works in, not in, 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 in completely unmysterious ways. Uh, so, so what happens is your interlocutor has one or two favored reporters, usually working for the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they feed them the, the distorted view. Right. version of the truth, that gets printed in the FT and the Wall Street Journal, then immediately all the other newspapers copy it, because, you know, journalists are very lazy people. Uh, and then it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage globally, uh, and, and, and a version of the truth that has nothing to do with the truth is registered as the truth. And I have absolutely no way of defending myself, so after a while I started recording every meeting. And I told them that. And then they limited massively the distortions. Right. They even apologized in print for things they had said. And the only reason why I, there, was, there were no libel cases about this book is because they knew that I can back up right. every dialogue which is in there. Well, there seems to be a lesson for us all. Go, you know, <laughs> go equipped. But what other lessons for, for us in the United Kingdom at this particular moment, on the basis of your very, very brutal experience of 2015? Well, I'll just choose two lessons. One concerns Brexit. I've been saying this since uh, the referendum, uh, and this was my advice to both parties, 
but primarily to the government because it was the government's uh, remit to begin the negotiations. Uh, do not start negotiations with the apparatchiks that Brussels will send you. Mr. Bernier has no mandate to negotiate. Mr. Bernier is being sent over to London uh, not to negotiate. He is a bureaucrat, he has a checklist of the things that he will demand of you, and he himself said so. Remember the first time he gave a press conference, he said there will be a two-phase negotiation. Phase one, Britain gives us everything we want. Phase two, we will discuss what you may want. Yeah, this is a declaration of hostilities. Imagine me coming to you saying, okay, uh, first you're going to give me everything I want, and then once you've given me everything I want, then we can discuss what you want, but no commitment that I'm going to give it to you. Okay? Um, so, the strategy of the Tory government of sending Mr. Davis initially, then I don't know whom, now it's Mrs. May doing it herself, to negotiate with Bernier would always going to lead to an 11th hour ultimatum from Brussels, take it or leave it, of a very bad deal. Right. Because unfortunately, and I'm saying this as a pro-European, somebody who campaigned against Brexit in favor of Remain, unfortunately, the moment the, the people of Britain voted to leave, the European Union bureaucracy had one incentive, to humiliate Britain. They do not want a mutually advantageous agreement. It is a nightmare for them to strike a mutually advantageous agreement with Britain. Because for them, what matters is to signal to the rest of the riffraff in Europe, you know, to the Spaniards, the Greeks, the Italians, that if you dare challenge us, you will be crushed. This is what they did with us. Uh, and this is why I've been advocating a completely different approach, an always style agreement. But that, I don't what want would to... you say to people who said that there's a tension in your politics and a tension in your story between Varoufakis, the proud European and internationalist, and Varoufakis, who is railing against these uh, corrupt, elite, closed, secretive, undemocratic institutions? That's the predicament of every progressive. <laughs> Remember the trades unions movement in the 19th century? Uh, the Labour Party? What was it set up to do? It was set up to challenge an establishment that was uh, pursuing policies and in, in implementing laws, the purpose of which were to constrain democracy, the purpose of which was to magnify inequality and to preserve the privileges of the privileged class. When you are starting a progressive movement against a regime which is uh, holding people back, holding the majority back, holding the many back. Uh, you are challenging the institutions of the state, but that does not mean that you are challenging the state. You, to be genuinely patriotic British or Scottish or English, whatever, uh, or Greek for that matter, as a patriot, you've got to criticize your government when your government is wrong, and that is not to go against your country. Similarly, as a proud Europeanist, yeah. it is my duty to criticize Brussels, uh, because Brussels is destroying and disintegrating the European Union through this combination of authoritarianism and inanity. So and denialism. Inanity. Inanity. Uh, stupidity. Okay. Yes, you do, you, do, you do write at length about um, idiocy. I can't remember in which one of the books, but you go back to the Greek roots, and it's a, th 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 these, are what, these are wonderful books. As I say, many villains, even more human, frail, tragic characters, but one hero. There's one hero I noticed in, um, in adults, and that's Danai, who is with us. My better yeah. half. And... And those of you who have read this book will know why, but those of you who have yet to read the book must know that whilst Yanis and many other people display um, moral courage, there is absolute physical courage displayed by Danai in one particular incident. This, this, this may amuse you. Just now I was talking to... Um, to Yanis and Danai outside, and I was congratulating her and admiring her because at one stage in the story, she, um, she physically comes between Yanis and a group 
of violent thugs in an Athens restaurant. And they have broken bottles and they are attacking Yanis and his, and his party in this restaurant. And she puts herself, she embraces him and puts herself between the violent attackers and, and her husband. And I, I'm sort of expressing admiration as anybody would outside this venue. And I said, and these fascists, and you took them on. And the two of them said, they weren't fascists, they were anarchists. <laughs> This is the problem with coming to the Edinburgh Book Festival and talking to intellectuals. You get the, you know, you confuse anarchists and fascists. So that was my schoolgirl era. But, but nonetheless, you both had to endure not just character assassination, but sometimes, you know, very serious intimidation as well. Yes. Yes, but, you know, as uh, Masha Ayokina said in the previous event, um, if you keep fearing such acts of violence, then you never do anything. And then you become prisoner of your fear. And as Franklin Roosevelt said quite correctly in 1933, the only thing we must fear is fear itself. And uh, in the end, we must ridicule the fear. And we must um, push constantly against it without ever overcoming it. Otherwise, we are prisoners. We are unfree people. We are unfree people. We are indeed. Another, another lesson for us. If I could just, before I open up to, um, to friends in this, little, in this little gathering of ours to, to make their questions and their comments, and my favorite, by the way, which is, um, which is comments very thinly veiled as questions. You know how to do that, don't you? You just have a little rant, not too long, just a little rant, and then say, don't you think? Like question time in Parliament. <laughs> Like question time or if you're fun. really good at it, you just elevate your voice a little bit at the yeah. end of the sentence, like you're French or Australian or something like that. So while you're formulating um, your contributions, I would just um, say, offer one little bit of mischief. I, you, you can tell I loved your books, but I was, the one thing I was missing was perhaps just a little bit more feminism, yeah. particularly in the book that you wrote for your daughter, um, which is a wonderful explanation of... of, of your economic thinking, but maybe there could have been a little bit more about the commoditization of women themselves and the lack of recognition of, of, of women's work, perhaps. Yes. So we might look no, forward I, to I, a, a I further confess. volume, perhaps, from Professor Varanakis on feminism. I confess entirely. Uh, on, on, uh, the adults in the room, my memoir of 2015, um, the, the, there are two things that I, I felt were seriously missing from it. One was the people. They're not in that book. It's a book about what yeah. was happening to me, what I was experiencing yeah. uh, behind closed doors, in our home, uh, on the phone. That's the result of... And there aren't enough women. But you know why that is? Because during those six months I was encased in a patriarchal male-dominated establishment and I just wanted to write down my memoirs of that experience. Mm. Uh, but the result is that from adults in the room, the masses out there mm. are almost absent. Except that uh, when they do come in, they are wonderful. I yes, mean, yes, but not enough. And, and women, yeah. I, I, I come to think of well, it. Well, the cleaners in the ministry, that's a wonderful moment when you go to the ministry and the, and the, the women, cleaners. the cleaners that's who've right. been locked out and not paid for however long are there. Oh, they were dismissed. Yeah. They were dismissed. It's, it's amazing. The country goes bankrupt because of the oligarchy, mm. um, effectively feasting on billions and billions and billions of loans. Uh, the state is bankrupt. The banks are bankrupt. The, banks, the bankers are bailed out, of course, like everywhere. Um, and the ministry, which is administering the most harsh austerity in the history of the world, seriously, we had a 15% reduction in 15% of GDP was lobbed off state expenditure. So you have a situation where uh, somebody was, who was receiving like, say, 1,200 quid a month pension now has to live on 250. We're talking about such brutality. And the ministry that was administering these misanthropic antisocial measures while paying advisors for 
the government ministers and alternate ministers and junior ministers, princely sums, mm. to advise them to do what? To cut. I mean, how much, why do you need expertise to cut? You know, you just take a cleaver and you cut. You, you don't need to pay <laughs> this was butchery, an advisor £250,000 yeah. yeah. a year to advise you on to how, how to cut a pension, right? And the same ministry fired 300 part-time cleaning women, cleaners, who were receiving 300 euros a month. And some of them had been working for 20, 25 years. They were 60 years, years yeah. of age. They would never get another job. And the first thing I did when I moved into the ministry was to rehire them. And the might of the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, Wall Street, uh, the German government came crashing down upon me because I dared to rehire those 300 women. These are the ones that Shami is talking and about. And you compare them to Green and Common women, don't you, when you, in, oh, in your Oh, because they, 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 they ex I, 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 I was at Green and Common. I, I, during the early 80s, uh, I was there a lot of the time. And I, I got exactly the same sensation. The way that those women two groups of women were organizing their public protests. You've got to remember, the, the cleaning ladies of the Ministry of Finance uh, had camped outside the ministry for two years. So that's the comparison with Green and yeah. Common. The way they were beaten up at night by thugs, working for the uh, deep state. The way that they were beaten up by riot squads. The way that they were being denigrated by the equivalent of the Times. Or, you know, the Guardian even. Uh, <laughs> I said that. Are there any? It's all right. There are no uh, journalists here. It's a, I said you know, equivalent of a government. Not <laughs> right. um, so the, 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 the comparison was was there. But if I may, just a second lesson from the book that yes. I think we should take out, please, for Britain. Uh, it's the one that I spoke of the day after your boss was elected, leader of the Labour Party. The manner in which the election of a decent politician, a dignified politician, who nevertheless goes against the grain of the establishment's policies, yeah. triggers off a fantastically planned character assassination attempt, which then leads to pressures within your party so that a very Greek coup in our case, a very British coup in your case, uh, will be in the offing in case he becomes prime minister. So that either he's forced to uh, turn himself into, uh, himself into a new Ramsay MacDonald or to be pushed out. This is, I think, the lesson that the Labour Party and the people of Britain can get out of this because I don't this know is what precisely the process. I don't know what you mean. This is never experienced anything like this myself. Look, um, Perhaps we could have some, a little light and we could um, open this discussion up to... Oh, aren't you pretty? And so young. <laughs> so um, who would... Um, we've got four roving mics and some very athletic colleagues who are going to whiz around. Um, why don't I do some groups of three? Would that suit you, Yanis? Groups of three? Fine. So why don't we start on this side, and then we'll go to the middle, and then we'll go over there. So can we have a group of three over here? Could we start um, in the front row here, please? And, um, and then we'll have two more in this group. Hello. Uh, I agree with your comment about the press. People like us can only work off information. How would you suggest we get that information? Great. And a second... Thank you. And then um, we'll go further back for the third. I, I believe that um, you did support the Remain campaign, um, but I was curious to know what mechanism you think could be used to democratise the European Union structure. Thank you very much. And then over there, yes. You've mainly been talking about uh, economics, uh, but often bad economics leads to demagoguery and then military adventurism. Do you have any concerns with what's going on in the country next door to you with Mr. Erdogan, are you concerned that he will go back to the sort of adventurism which we saw in, when there was a previous military leadership in both of your countries? Wonderful, three fantastic. Uh, yeah. And when you do get the mic, do hold it really, I think you need to hold it really, really close to, uh, to be heard. So the press, what do we do? Uh, we, we still need information. Uh, how would you, democratizing Europe. Europe. 
and Turkey. Okay. Um, Jeremy Corbyn has demonstrated quite magnificently, and I think we, we did it in Greece too, before 2015, that it is perfectly possible to ignore the toxic media, to ignore the character assassination attempts, to use social media, and also um, a steadfast determination to stick to an honest account of the choices that the people are facing. In the end, this will persevere. As, for, as far as your task is concerned as a citizen, as a voter, I think you have an obligation, we all have an obligation, to go beyond, beyond the Sun, the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, to seek information from first principles ourselves. We now have the tools to do it. To be an active citizen means actively to search for the truth behind the propaganda. The only way we can restore democracy and we can keep it alive is to uh, be active. And both as politicians and as activists, to treat the media with the contempt that they deserve, because, after all, we live in something like Soviet times. There is one line that is coming from the establishment media. But in the end, most people don't believe it anymore. Mm. Uh, but what we must believe, just like dissidents in the Soviet Union in the early 1980s found ways of becoming informed about what was going on in their country, we need to do the same thing in the West, and we must stop uh, relying on the comfortable uh, illusion that we live in a mediatic democracy. We don't. On the question of what we do to democratize Europe, look, the democratization of Europe is not going to take place through negotiating with Barnier, through discussions within the European Union summit. It will have to involve a pan-European democratic movement that effectively storms the castles of the institutions of Europe in exactly the same way that we have to do it in our own nations, in our own states, in our own countries. We need to take over the institutions of our democracies and to make them work for the demos. That will not be an easy task, but compare and contrast two possibilities, two scenarios. One is Britain gets out of the European Union and goes its own way, hoping to reconstitute democracy within the borders of the United Kingdom. That's one scenario. How well do you think this is going to work? I don't think it's going to work very well. Because most of the problems you are facing in this country are like climate change. You need local action, but you need internationalism as well. Uh, whether it is a question of pushing up investment in good quality jobs in the green economy, whether it is a question of alleviating poverty. You cannot alleviate poverty in Britain when the rest of Europe is sinking into greater inequality and more poverty in Spain, in Greece, in Italy. You cannot create a green transition in this country when we have more and more investment in diesel technology in Germany and in France. We need to work together on this. So the second scenario is this. It's what I actually I had the audacity of proposing it to George Osborne once. We were in ECOFIN. ECOFIN is the the gathering of the ministers of finance of the European Union, not your Euro, but ECOFIN, not just the Euro area. And I said to him, George, we actually had a good relationship on a personal basis. Nobody's perfect. Um, <laughs> and I said to him, you know, I mean, he, he, we, we were in agreement in criticizing certain policies that were coming out of France and Germany. I said, look, why don't we bind together and veto the hell out of them? Every time they come up with a policy which you think is, is undemocratic or not in the interest of Britain, Greece, and so on, why don't we just veto them together? And then we'll bring in other countries as well. We, you know, we're open other financing. Of course, he looked at me as if I was uh, you know, an instrument of Satan. <laughs> because the only time George Osborne ever spoke in ECOFIN was to defend the city of London. Never <laughs> spoke a word, um, even in edgeways, about anything else. But imagine a situation where you have a progressive government in Britain, um, one or two progressive governments in Europe, and we veto the hell out of them. 
Now, that is a far more effective way of transforming the European Union. Ideally, what I would like to see is a grassroots movement. This is what we've done with DiEM25, the Democracy in Europe movement, uh, across Europe that is pushing for what we call constitutional assemblies everywhere in Europe to decide, to discuss amongst ourselves what kind of governance we want across Europe to deal with the four crises that are pulling our societies apart. The crisis of private debt, which is destroying this country, yet again. The crisis of public debt, which is always the excuse behind austerity. The crisis of very low investment in things that matter, especially the green transition, and poverty. And decide how we're going to act upon those four scourges that are commonly faced by Europeans. Uh, and finally, Erdogan and Turkey. Look, Turkey has been growing very well for a decade now under Erdogan. Erdogan initially was a reformer. He managed to take out of the political and economic equation the military, and that was an achievement. But then, I mean, Shami initially said that some power corrupts. Well, as you know, a great deal of power corrupts a great deal. Um, Erdogan at some point became so enmeshed with the oligarchy of Turkey and so authoritarian and so crazed uh, with his own authority. Uh, but nevertheless, the economy was supporting his uh, uh, new regime. Why? Post-2008, as you know, central banks like the Fed in the United States, like the Bank of England here, like the Bank of Japan in Japan, produced tsunamis of cash to reflow to the financial sector. The European Central Bank still does, the Bank of Japan still does, but the British Central Bank and the American ones have stopped doing it. All the liquidity, the cash that was generated in the last eight years or so, seeped out of the financial system of the West, of Japan, of England, and so on, and found its way into so-called emerging markets. They needed to, to, those who had that money, who had given that, that cash, needed to invest it somewhere to get some returns. Within zero interest rates everywhere, that was not easy. So countries like Turkey received, I'll give you a number, um, net around 250 billion pounds every year, net. These were the inflows that supported the stupendous growth that you've had in, in Turkey. Today, with uh, the pumps uh, not functioning anymore in the United States and in Britain, this liquidity is now being taken out of the system. So emerging markets are facing a dearth of liquidity. So the only way the Turkish economy could continue to grow in this way and for Erdogan to build his new authoritarian regime on the basis of that growth uh, would be to have another 250 billion pounds every year flowing into Turkey. But that's no longer happening. And now Erdogan is caught up in his own hubris because as an Islamist, he's arguing that interest rates are a bad thing. Nobody likes him high interest rates, but he has this almost uh, religious commitment, right. not almost, religious commitment to not allowing the Central Bank of Turkey to increase interest rates in order to arrest the outflow of money. And at the same time, he does not want to slap capital controls, impediments to the export of money from Turkey because his friendly oligarchs want to take their money out of Turkey. But you can't have it both ways. You can't say no to capital controls and to high interest rates. What happens is the money leaves and you have the implosion that you have. In combination with the uh, very uh, imbalanced, uh, precarious political situation, you have a Turkey that now is... Um, uh, on the brink of a major crisis, political, economic, financial, and social. I sincerely hope, as a Greek, that this does not translate, as it usually happens in authoritarian regimes, into imperialism, yeah. into creating some kind of uh, a skirmish, mm. some kind of uh, short-lived but acute war with their neighboring countries like Greece in order to distract mm. domestic public opinion and to solidify the regime. Authoritarian regimes are very good at that. Aren't you Mr. Sunshine? 
We live in a very dark world. We do. But we have to create our own rays of sunshine. Yeah. And we will do this by adopting Antonio Gramsci's line that we must have a very pessimistic mind and a very hopeful heart. I think we have um, time for a few more points, if people are succinct. This time it'll be two women and a man, because affirmative action is employed um, by this chair. Um, so, uh, find me a woman, go on. <laughs> on, this, uh, on this side of the, um, of the house. Lovely, thank you. So, I agree... Where are you? Hello. Over oh, there. hi. Over there. Hi. So while I agree that uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal and the FT uh, and the other major media aren't the only sources, um, in America, social media uh, isn't necessarily to be de believed either. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and <laughs> we have a president who um, has his own version of facts and truth uh, that seem to change by the hour. Um, and so, uh, while I understand your perspective on media, maybe uh, over here, uh, uh, on this side of the pond, maybe not so much in the United States, I'd love to hear your take um, on the media as it relates to American politics. Okay, sure. and another, um, another person on this side of the, yep. Hello, thank you. Um, you said some 10 minutes ago that we should not negotiate with the apparatchiks. They have an agenda, and even when that agenda is hidden, there's no way forward with them. My question is very simple. Is there anyone with whom we can negotiate uh, when we're trying to deal with the, the, the notion of Brexit in this country at the moment? Thank you, sir. And then do I have another woman uh, on this side of the house, maybe a little further back. Yeah, running shoes, running shoes. No pressure, don't slip, health and safety. <laughs> Hello. I can't see, but I'm Hi. hopeful. There. Hi there. What do you think your chances are of becoming the next Greek Prime Minister? <laughs> of him being Prime Minister? Sorry, I, I couldn't of hear which you. which country? Would you just repeat that, please, madam? What do you think your chances are of becoming the next Greek uh -huh. Prime Minister? Ah. Greek Prime Minister. I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that position. Um, so. Okay, I'll start with the last one. Um, if you asked me, um, in 2013, 2014, what are the chances that you will become Finance Minister of Greece? I would laugh in your face. Uh, look, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that we have change at the political level that allows the many to regain control of their lives. Who is filling which office is neither here nor there. Uh, but let me go to... I'll, I'll take them in Don't the reverse Don't be so order. coy. You've got to say a little more about that. Are you, are you thinking about going back? You're thinking about going back into Oh, uh, I, I am supposedly the leader of a party called Mera 25. Uh, Mera means day in Greek, but it also means the, f the front of Europeanist um, radical disobedience. <laughs> so we are running in the elections, so I'm going to be competing. But so you I'm haven't not been interested in predictions. But you haven't been put off by this, this oh, no. experience? No, 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 no. no. I, now, I, you know, once I threw my hat in the, in the political ring, in the party political ring, I'm, I'm not getting out. Wow. We created our own political movement. We are going to run across Europe in 11 countries as DiEM25 uh, in May 2019 in the pan-European parliament elections. And we, I, probably on the same day, there's going to be a national election and um, I'm, being, I'm going to be contesting it. Now, how we're going to do? It's up to the Greek demos. Now, uh, your question about who do you negotiate with? The answer is no one. And let me be succinct on this. The European Union cannot negotiate with London a proper Brexit deal because there is no one to negotiate. Remember what Henry Kissinger once said? He said, the problem I have with Europe 
He said, I don't have a telephone number to call. I don't know who to speak to. You speak to Macron, to Barnier, to Merkel. It is impossible. So that's why my recommendation has always been, after the Brexit referendum, uh, to respect leavers who won, for better or for worse. We, we supported the Remain campaign, but as Democrats, we have to accept that leave won. You have to respect leave. And the recommendation I come up with, consistently now for almost two years, is a Norway-style agreement. You come out of the EU, you stay in the single market and the customs union uh, for a period of five years, renewable, in order to give your House of Commons the opportunity, without a ticking clock and a gun on its head, to debate amongst the representatives of the British people what you want the future arrangements between the EU and the UK to be. And also you detoxify the situation because Angela Merkel is going to be, um, immediately she will be becalmed because she will think that's a problem for the next Chancellor of Germany or the, the one after that. Uh, and look, I am, in, in this country I, was, I, 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 I can be described as a Benite. Uh, it, I was always a Tony Benn supporter as a young person. He was right to fight against the entry of the UK into that European common market, I think. But 43 years have passed. Your economy, your society, your polity has become intertwined with the EU to such an extent that it is impossible to disentangle without causing much damage within two years. So, the beauty of the Norway solution, and I will actually go beyond Norway, I would call it Norway Plus, uh, but we don't have much time to discuss the technicalities of it. The beauty of it is that you don't have to negotiate. You just file an application for a Norway-style agreement, and none of them can say no to you. Politically, it would be poison for Merkel, Macron, to say no to a British request for a single market customs union for five years. So, it, Barnier would be fired. The Article 50 process would end because you, nothing would change effectively except you, the agricultural common policy and fisheries that would return to Britain, like Norway has its own. And then the British nation, the English nation, the Scottish nation, the Welsh nation, huh, will have the opportunity to, uh, in the fullness of time and without pressures and without a gun on the head of the government, to decide what you want the future arrangements to be, and then you can have negotiations that are tailor-made to that collective decision. And finally, uh, social media, United Donald States, Trump. and the European Union. Donald Trump, fake news. Yes. Well, fake look, news. I don't think there is a great difference between the European Union and the United States. Uh, do you remember the term manufacturing consent? It was not invented by Noam Chomsky uh, in order to describe the situation in Europe. It was invented to describe the manner in which the New York Times, in particular, you know, this uh, pillar of the liberal establishment in the United States, distorted the facts of the Vietnam War, distorted the facts about the military-industrial complex, distorted the facts about the security apparatus and the CIA and the coup d'etats in Chile and in Greece and other places. So there's nothing new here. Fake news was not invented by Donald Trump. Fake news has been always manufactured by our established media. What Donald Trump did very cleverly was to attack the liberal establishment using the new apparatus of social media in a manner that has been practiced before in the mid-war period by the Nazis and the fascists. Because let me remind you that the most some of the most apt criticisms of financial capitalism of the 1920s, especially of the Weimar Republic, came not just from the left, but from people like Joseph Goebbels. If you read the speeches of Goebbels in the 1920s, the first part is actually very interesting and very apt and very accurate. At some point, once he has exposed the way in which the liberal establishment is taking the masses of the majority of people to the cleaners, the way that they are constantly looking after the bankers and the financial interests of the oligarchy and so on, then we have to kill the Jews, right? But you have to remember, the fascists and the Nazis did not win power because they promised Europeans the gulag. 
or the concentration camp or a war. They promised that they will bring dignity back to the common folk. Mussolini promised and delivered the first social welfare state. Pensions like Salvini is doing now, the fascist Salvini is doing today in Italy. Donald Trump is attacking the deep state in the same way that Hitler was attacking the Weimar Republic. The difference between us and Donald Trump is he is attacking the deep state in order to capture it and to use it for him and his mates. He's the man who said that he's going to, what did he say about, the, um, about Wall Street and the swamp, that he would drain the swamp? First thing he does, he takes people from Goldman Sachs and appoints them. So, social media are putrid. They are just a, a, a conduit of filth. But nevertheless, they are also instruments that we can use. And the Labour Party, Adam Corbyn, under Corbyn, has used it very well. We cannot turn over these technological innovations no. to the fascists, to the Trumps of the world, or indeed to the Financial Times. We have to use them and combine them with serious politics on the ground, serious debate, um, democratic politics where, uh, let me remind you that th what really marks our democratic politics is people who do not believe that they have all the answers getting together to crowdsource collectively answers. We need to move together in the United States, in the continent of Europe, in the United Kingdom, in countries like Mexico, in India, even China, to create a progressive international by which to oppose on the one hand the deep establishment and on the other the nationalist fascist international that Donald Trump is leading. There we have it. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. If you enjoyed this event, my name was Shami Chakrabarti. Whether you did or you didn't, please congratulate once more Yanis Varoufakis. Well, thank you, Shami.